and they're ready to enter the terminal count after getting out of this hold. So things are looking good. A very smooth count up until this point. And as you look at the camera views that we're showing you, you can see that condensation coming off the rocket as the wind blows by. In fact, the middle portion of the rocket is white. It was tanned before. Just where it lines up with the U, L, and A, that is all ice covering that portion of the rocket, which has been chilled down to minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Minus 184 degrees Celsius, <laughs> roughly. That's right. That's right. Mick, Mick's got his little professor calculator here, and he's doing on-the-fly metric calculations. Appreciate that. Hey, you know, this, uh, this is an interesting rocket because it is configured in a very unique way. Tell us a little bit more about that, Mick. Yeah, the Atlas V 411 vehicle we're flying this, this evening is a unique configuration in the fact that it has one solid rocket booster on the vehicle. Uh, that's a unique configuration for ULA and uh, this vehicle. This configuration has uh, flown uh, five times, uh, including NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. So tonight will be the sixth mission. Uh, our first stage, or our booster, is powered by uh, RD-180 engine. Uh, this engine burns uh, RP-1 and liquid oxygen as it's fueled. Or RP-1 is a highly purified kerosene. So that... Uh, helps deliver the thrust we need and delivering that thrust tonight above about 860,000 pounds or 1.2 million pounds with the solid rocket booster. That's 5.2 million Newtons, just in case you're wondering. Thank you. Um, but uh, we would do move on up the stage to the second stage, which is Centaur using an RL-10A engine. This will be the last single RL-10A flown on this configuration. From here on out, they'll use two engines uh, to fly on an Atlas vehicle. So we're very proud of that this evening. The RL-10 engine is a cryogenic engine, so it uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen as its fuel in the uh, upper stage, producing about 22,000 pounds of thrust or 99.2 kilonewtons. I was hoping you had that <laughs> metric conversion. Did and well. It, unique, unique configuration that we're happy to fly tonight. All right, very good. Uh, thank you, Mick. And, you know, uh, to this point, uh, the count has gone very smooth. Uh, we've heard nothing but good reports. So we'll turn it back over to Joshua in the studio, and we'll continue to monitor Gentlemen, the count here. Count us down. Joshua. Thank you very much, Joshua. We look forward to getting on with the count in just a few minutes. We are, of course, in a hold at this very moment, T-minus four minutes in holding. But we've got a little bit of business to do as we go through here. So far, nothing to report in terms of uh, the count itself and the teams. Everything working pretty smooth to this point, Mick. Yeah, everything is good. Uh, ULA launch conductor Scott Barney is uh, giving his briefing right now to his team of what's going to happen as they get ready to pick up the uh, – uh, poll at T-minus 4 and counting, but uh, while we see the teams here in all different places, Daryl, we have them all over the world. Uh, what we see on the screen here is the team in the Mission Director Center here at AE, mm -hmm. which has our ESA folks uh, up front. And then just across the way, just a few miles away, is the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. That is where the ULA launch team is uh, going through their count. And then, of course, uh, in Denver, uh, we have a team out there as well. Um, the Denver Operations Support Center in Denver, Colorado, where ULA is based. In addition to that, we have a European space operations oh, in yep, Germany. Absolutely. We have uh, ESA teams supporting, uh, as uh, you heard earlier, from uh, Germany, where they will operate and control the spacecraft after it separates this evening. So big collaboration of teams that have put this mission together and get ready for launch this evening. And we've had some fun talking about the conversions between standard and metric, but uh, we were talking earlier, Mick, um, there's actually, that played a role 
in working with this uh, international collaboration because m much of what our teams here in America do is on standard and overseas they're on metrics. So uh, there was a little bit of a uh, you know, conversion that had to go between. Yeah, absolutely. It's been really fun working with our international partners on this mission. And there have been some challenges uh, with the with the unit conversions and some communications, but uh, that has been key, is communication between the teams. All of us uh, has been done very well, and uh, as Tim Dunn put it, uh, our launch manager from NASA, at our readiness review last week, we all speak the universal language of mission success, and that's what's gotten us here uh, this evening. So working with our international partners has been fun. We're very excited to see Solar Orbiter uh, get off the Earth tonight and head on its way to the sun to start its science. And it's going to do some big science once uh, once it's there and in orbit. For now, we are looking at a shot of the rocket on the ground as uh, the water vapor condenses around the super-cooled liquid oxygen. In just a few seconds, we are going to get um, a status poll from launch director Scott Barney of ULA. And uh, he's going to give that and uh, a final check before we uh, begin to resume the count. Let's listen in now as uh, Scott conducts that poll over at United Launch Alliance. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulic. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatic. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Asgas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Rick, go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC, verified T0 is set for 0403 Zulu. Verified. And so we are on time and on schedule for this launch at 1103 Eastern time there. You just got the, the confirmed account from uh, Scott Barney. That's good news. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you, my heart's beating uh, really good. Uh, it's awesome to hear the team give a go and everything's clear. That means they've been working all their stuff and everything looks good on the vehicle. Uh, targeting an 1103 uh, p.m. Eastern uh, time liftoff. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to hear that uh, poll. That's right. And now they're configuring the spacecraft to go on to internal power off of its shore power, its land power. Talk about that. Yeah, in parallel with the launch team getting the launch vehicle ready, the spacecraft team is preparing the solar orbiter uh, satellite uh, to get ready. And we just heard uh, over our nets that the uh, spacecraft is on internal power, configured for launch. Everything looks green and go. Uh, so we've heard from the spacecraft and from the launch vehicle that things look really good tonight uh, to get solar orbiter off the ground. That's a... That's a beautiful thing to hear on the net uh, that we're moving forward and uh, working no issues. And now Tim Dunn's NASA's uh, launch director uh, will uh, begin to, to look at his team and uh, conduct uh, his portion of the business. Yes, he'll he'll check in with his NASA chief engineer, Dave Solberger, and uh, LSP uh, Chuck Duvall and uh, make sure the NASA team is ready to support and uh, proceed forward. So we'll hear how things go. It's a beautiful evening outside if uh, you are in the area and uh, uh, ready to watch this rocket launch. It's going to be a beauty. We've got a full moon tonight here in Florida and uh, across the area. And as well, we're going to see this uh, beautiful launch. Um, this spot right here is our Banana Creek viewing area. We can see um, we've got uh, several hundred people out there in total, probably about 1,000, 4,000 uh, across the entire the area. Let's count it in to the terminal count, three, two, and one. And we have begun our count and resumed it. That's we are now three minutes and 53 seconds away from liftoff. That's correct. And we did hear uh, our NASA launch manager, Tim Dunn, say that the NASA team is go. He reported that out to ULA's launch director, uh, Lou Mangieri. And uh, so that's a good uh, good call out for us, too, to hear that the vehicle is ready to proceed tonight. And as you said, that was a beautiful sight of the Atlas out there on the pad. And uh, things are looking really well for an 1103 liftoff this evening. 
And this is, you mentioned this earlier about the configuration with that one solid rocket booster on the side. Sometimes uh, people have asked, you know, how does that work with uh, having one booster on the side of the rocket? Uh, doesn't it kind of push the rocket over? Yeah, it does, actually. Uh, but uh, I will say we talked about the first stage booster engine, the RD-180. The RD-180 has a, a lot of control margin left that it can offset that asymmetrical setup of the one solid on the 411 uh, vehicle. The 411 vehicle is a unique configuration that will provide a great ride for Solar Orbiter this evening, as it has done for five other missions uh, in this configuration. So, yeah, RD-180 takes over and, and works really well to make sure the vehicle gets off the pad and heads the space we're supposed to. Two uh, minutes and 45 seconds until liftoff here as we get down to the final minutes of the count. The launch teams in a flurry of activity right now as uh, they are listening in and talking to their uh, various team members before this launch takes off. It's an exciting moment as we get down now here to the final few minutes. Uh, talk about the teams and the activity that's going on right now. Yeah, it takes a lot of uh, con control between the teams, make sure they're all talking together. They're actually preparing their final preps of getting the tanks to flight pressures, getting all the valves in the right position, making sure avionics is ready to go and the vehicle is is all green uh, as it continues to uh, be topped off and basically putting that last little bit of fuel into the tanks for uh, Centaur and Booster and uh, things are going well. Vehicle has to go on internal power just prior to uh, liftoff and so the team is continuing to work all of that uh, as they get ready for liftoff at 11.03. Very good and the count now going uh, under one minute and 40 seconds. Well, let's listen in as the activity uh, begins to pick up on the FPS countdown on. net. We just heard that FTS was armed, flight termination system, which uh, our friends at the United Space Force uh, will follow the launch from this okay, evening. FTS count started. 115. 110. Vent valves locked. Locking the vent valves will bring the uh, booster tank uh, and the tanks up minute. to flight pressure, Rock. getting the, everything seven. ready for green, green. Uh, launch this evening. We just heard from the range officer that the range is green and ready to uh, move forward. The range is green. That is a big step moving forward. Um, everything's clear, basically mean there there is no uh, nothing to impede launch, nothing out there in the water, nothing out there in the air. T-minus 30 seconds as we count down to the liftoff of an Atlas V rocket. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Pusitar. Go Solar Orbiter. There you heard the final status check for Booster Centaur and the spacecraft. Everything is go. And so here we go. T-minus 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Four, three, two, one, zero. And liftoff of our solar orbit and international collaboration to give us new images and a better understanding of our life giving star. Listening now, you drone voice and Patrick Moore, ULA's launch commentator. Now 25 seconds. Flight. Chamber pressure on the SRV looks good. It's not bringing parameters on the RD-180 also look good. Good report so far. Atlas 5 beginning to pitch over. 35 seconds in. Vehicle is completing the pitch over maneuver. Now 41 seconds into flight. 45 seconds into flight. Everything is looking good. We heard that the RD-180 engine was operational. RD-180 model. throttling down slightly as expected and engine response looks good. I'm going to pull those engines down for just a little bit as we anticipate max Q. Vehicles now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. All right, maximum dynamic pressure is the period of maximum mechanical stress on the rocket because it's reached its highest velocity and resistance created by the Earth's atmosphere. made it through and they're throttling back up and standing by for SRB burnout
and we have burnout on the solid rocket booster. Atlas will hold on to the SRB for an additional 47 seconds prior to jettison. They're going to let that thing go at 2 minutes and 19 seconds. Now that 1 minute 45 boost. seconds into flight. RD-180 continues to perform well at full thrust. Pump speeds and injector pressures look good. All right, stand by now for booster jettison. And now coming up on two minutes into flight, the Atlas V vehicle now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight. RD-180 throttling down slightly as expected and the response to continues to look good. And standing by for SRV jettison shortly. Now look to your screen and we have good you'll see it. There it goes. Of the solid rocket booster. Atlas V has gone to Q-Alpha limited closed loop steering. Vehicle body rates look good. Now the next major milestone is... Now 2 minutes 35 seconds into flight. At 3 minutes and 25 seconds. And the second stage RCS system press valve is opened. System now pressurizing the flight levels. Flying at over 5,000 miles per hour. Now three minutes into flight, approximately one minute remaining until Pico. And he's talking about main engine cutoff. One minute. RD-180 continues Pico. to look good. At, uh, pump speeds and injector pressures look good. Three minutes, 15 seconds in. All right, about to cut that booster. Vehicle body rates look stable. Seconds. Now three minutes, 30 seconds in. RD-180 now throttling to maintain a constant 5G acceleration limit. Engine response looks good. And we've begun boost phase chill down. Now throttling to a 4.6G acceleration limit. Boost phase chill down is ended. Standing by for BECO. And we have Beco booster engine cut off, standing by for stage Atlas Centaur separation. And we have good indication of Atlas Centaur separation. We have pre-start on the RL-10, standing by for ignition. Next major milestone is the payload fairing. When that comes off, we have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rates look good. That payload. And we have good jettison. indication of payload fairing jettison. Right now. This first burn of today's mission will last approximately eight minutes. And the RCS system is now performing initial firings to warm up the RCS motor catalyst bed. System response looks good. And the Centaur is now 100 miles in altitude, 450 miles downrange distance, traveling at 11,800 miles per hour. Five minutes, 10 seconds into flight. You're listening to the voice of Patrick Moore, ULA's uh, launch commentator. <laughs> Centaur propellant utilization system has gone to closed loop control. Flight is looking very good at this point. And RCS system now performing periodic firing for thermal conditioning of the system. System response looks good. And initial review of booster performance shows the booster performed uh, close to uh, pre-flight predictions. So the next major milestone will be the Centaur first main engine cutoff, and we've got about, uh, let's say, five to six minutes before that. Let's bring Mick Woltman back in. Um, what did you think about uh, the liftoff and, and the flight and separation? Looked pretty good from here. Yeah, as we were listening to Patrick yeah, there, we could hear all the performed mark events. Uh, hear, hear all the mark events that were hit, and 
it seems like first stage performed very nominal and RD1E performed very well to get the first stage and Centaur on its way. So uh, things are looking really well on this flight. That Centaur uh, performing uh, a thrust of about 22,000 pounds and flying in what Mick has been described to me as a very exact entry into orbit. It's not going all the way around the Earth, but it does have to have a certain amount of precision because it's a partial orbit around Earth. Yeah, this first burn will get uh, Centaur and Solar Orbiter into a semicircular uh, orbit as we uh, come around the Earth, and then we will get ready for our uh, main engine start number two, uh, and that will get us onto our transfer trajectory orbit, so our transfer trajectory to head off toward the sun. So, yeah, Centaur has to perform very well on this first uh, burn to get into that uh, semicircular park orbit. And it's a lot of power that's needed in, in order to get this thing going because uh, uh, she's going off into the deeper part of space headed to the sun. We're getting a report of good performance so far, and that's uh, excellent news. The team here in just a moment from uh, uh, Yole Scott Messer, but until then, we are tracking this flight and the successful flight that it has been so far. You're looking at a graphical representation of exactly uh, what we're expecting the flight uh, to look like, and everything is looking good at this point. Uh, matter of fact, Daryl, uh, we just heard uh, we've got main engine cutoff, so uh, Centaur uh, is uh, shut down its engine for the first uh, firing. Things look good, body rates have damped out, and everything looks good on this mission so far. Um, so as we get ready to go, Centaur will continue to uh, its mission by uh, rolling and turning to the position it needs to get ready for main engine start two, that uh, transfer orbit or transfer trajectory that we talked about. Mm -hmm. The uh, engine will need to uh, get ready and chill down and, and get ready to fire up. Uh, this coast period that we're in will be about uh, 30 minutes uh, to get into position before we have to uh, fire up the uh, Centaur engine again. Uh, that'll be about 38, 39 minutes into the mission that we will do that, and it will uh, fire for roughly six minutes uh, to get into that transfer orbit. So uh, Centaur performing very well. Uh, Atlas Centaur and Solar Orbiter on its way. So things are looking really good. This is a bit of a coast phase, you would describe Coast right? Coast phase, yes. Centaur performing well and, and doing some maneuvers here in this so coast make, phase. Take it away. So. That's right, Josh. Right. It's a big so moment good. that uh, everybody is uh, really anticipating here at this port of the, this portion of the mission. He's Mick Woltman. I'm Daryl Nail. 25 years as a vehicle <laughs> systems engineer, so he's got all the knowledge to help break this down. And I will tell you, it's exciting every time we launch. The next mission is the most important, and uh, tonight was uh, great to see Solar Orbiter get off the ground. And like you said, we still have some things to do to make sure it's a uh, mission success. But uh, we're moving along, and uh, things are looking really well. Uh, Centaur is in its uh, f phases of uh, settling propellants and getting ready for that main engine start, too. Uh, coming up, so uh, things are looking really good. Yeah, and he's not just uh, uh, just saying that, folks. I literally got to watch him get a little giddy as, uh, <laughs> as we're getting ready to lift off. So it was an exciting moment. Uh, we are in that coast phase. We've been in this coast phase um, for quite a period of time now. We've got Body a few minutes left in it, and as you mentioned burn. before, you can see in this graphical representation that um, there are thrusters that are being fired from time to time to settle that fuel inside of uh, inside of the Centaur, and that will allow it to restart. It's really one of the keys to this vehicle. And this vehicle, in fact, is pretty reliable. It's gotten really good at doing this, and it goes all the way back to the 1960s. Yeah, Centaur was designed uh, for multiple uh, engine starts and, and missions like this, uh, so it's a very reliable uh, vehicle to get that way. Uh, we're seeing uh, now that we have pre-chilled down on the engine, which means the engine is chilling down and getting ready for uh, fuels to uh, get through and uh, start up ignition. Uh, the igniters would fire, and we would get uh, MES-2. We're uh, standing by for that call right now. We should be coming up on main engine start uh, fairly shortly. So we just heard uh, that uh, we have full thrust and uh, Main engine has started, and body rates look good for this uh, seven-minute uh, burn of uh, the Centaur engine. Now, this is a key burn um, as it refires that engine and starts to get uh, into that transfer orbit, right? 
Um, it's, a, it's partially gone around the earth, and now it needs to get on to its destination. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fire and get us into that transfer uh, trajectory uh, to get uh, solar orbiter on its way to the sun, which is very important uh, for us. So uh, once uh, this burn uh, happens, we get through this successful seven-minute burn, uh, we'll be coming up on spacecraft separation, which will be a, another major milestone for us. Uh, however, uh, we will not be celebrating quite yet. Um, solar orbiter has to get moving on its way, and we have to make sure we acquire signal from the satellite uh, which will happen about uh, four minutes after separation. Uh, so that will be a major milestone for the uh, spacecraft crew and the launch team. But uh, this milestone of main engine start and this burn, second burn that we refer to, is a uh, major step in the right direction. And, of course, this is uh, kind of the, the, the safe period of this entire uh, launch and mission. The toughest part is getting it off the ground. We go back to 11.03 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, when it lifted off. Um, you know, that is a that is a big moment to see that thing coming off that pad, riding a controlled explosion on up yeah, into space. Yeah, uh, the team does a very good job. They make it look easy. Uh, matter of fact, I, uh, as we heard from Scott Messer earlier, this was the quietest count he's heard in, in quite a while. And, you know, that uh, is a, just a shout-out to the teams and how well they have done all the collaboration between the international partner, the United Space Force, NASA, uh, LSP, ULA, all the teams working together to make sure the count uh, happened on time and uh, the vehicle got off at 11.03, uh, specifically at the beginning of our window. That is just uh, that's always exciting to me to watch that. Uh, every launch is just uh, amazing to uh, see that uh, fire and, and lift off. We've been flying for about 45 and a half minutes uh, to this point in time, and uh, ULA managers have been working this uh, launch uh, for that entire time. And uh, as Mick said, they are... Uh, continuing to, to be very diligent in tracking the telemetry and uh, tracking the flight of the Centaur upper stage. Uh, it is in the midst of a seven-minute burn, a few minutes left in that one, as it positions itself uh, to get into that proper orbit. Uh, it is going to use a gravity assist eventually, much later down the road, um, but uh, that is part of the deal in order to get this thing close to the sun uh, so it can start gathering its data. Um, it's got a lot of uh, interesting in instruments on board. In particular, you know, one of the ones that I find, one of the aspects of this spacecraft that I find most interesting is its ability to open up little ports on its heat shield. Uh, it's going to get so close to the sun, and it's going to point its heat shield at the sun, but it's got little ports that it opens up inside the space, inside the, the heat shield to allow the sun to come through, which is an amazing thing. It's got to cool the instruments because yes. it's going to be so incredibly hot. Yeah, the heat shield is a, is a specific part of this uh, spacecraft that's required. As you said, it gets really close to the sun, you know, a couple million mile, miles, which is close for a spacecraft. Right. And, um, but those little apertures inside the heat shield get opened at particular times to catch things catch sunlight, catch ultraviolet lights, test things in the instrument, and help protect the instrument. So the, the, the satellite basically rides around the sun with that heat shield pointing at the sun at all times. Uh, another unique feature for myself as an engineer that I thought was really neat of this satellite was the solar panels when they come out. Uh, normally we see on, on a satellite uh, solar panels come out, and they're pretty flat in order to get sunlight uh, to power the systems, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Charge the batteries and, and do all the other things on board. Uh, these, uh, because we're so close to the sun, they actually have, the team actually has to turn these uh, solar panels almost at 78 degrees uh, to keep them from that? from getting too hot uh -huh. and, you know, collecting. But they have, uh, as Ian Walters from Airbus said, who designed this uh, spacecraft, uh, said, we do not have a problem with power on the solar panels. So, a problem with heat. <laughs> exactly. We have a problem with heat. So uh, that's a unique uh, thing about the spacecraft that I find interesting. Absolutely. Just a little less than two minutes left in this uh, burn, the second burn of the Centaur upper stage is it uh, gets ready to transfer into its new orbit. Um, it's an exciting time. Uh, we certainly know that the team is anticipating that uh, cutoff of that engine, but also, more importantly, looking for uh, the separation of the spacecraft, which is coming up uh, just a few minutes after that, and then followed by, hopefully, some signal acquisition. Absolutely. The spacecraft tells us, I'm here. 
it's kind of opened its eyes, so to speak, right, and says, that, uh, I'm yeah. in position, I'm, I'm heading the right direction. Yeah, the spacecraft team knows that the satellite's where it's supposed to be and, and that uh, the Atlas Centaur has delivered it on the proper orbit, as you were talking earlier, that precise orbit that we need. You know, we've had two burns now. This is the second burn, and that uh, second burn of this Centaur will put it in that orbit uh, trajectory or uh, transfer trajectory that the team is looking for. So acquisition of signal after SEP is, is very important. Uh, but uh, we're still still getting there. So 49 minutes into flight and things are going well. Uh, Centaur pressures on the engine look really good. Uh, engine continues to perform anomaly and the RCS thrusters uh, continue to keep uh, Centaur where it needs to be. A little less than a minute until main engine cutoff. You can see in the graphical representation, this Centaur continues to fly with solar orbiter at the very front of it. Uh, that RL-10 uh, firing behind it as it goes. And just about 20 seconds now until we see that engine cut off and go into that next coach phase. So let's uh, watch now and listen in as they get close to this moment. Um, this is the, again, the uh, sec, the Centaur second main engine cutoff. Nominal. Body rates look good. So yeah, Centaur continues to perform nominally. Body rates on Centaur look really good. Standing by for cutoff and in approximately Standing by here for uh, main engine cutoff. And we have Miko main engine cutoff. And there you go. Body rate stamped out nicely yep. from the cutoff transient. Main engine cutoff from the Centaur. That's great. That okay. second burn has uh, performed. Uh, so now we're about three minutes away from spacecraft separation, our next big milestone. So I can tell you the, the launch team is very happy on how Centaur performed. And uh, looking at the data, uh, Centaur performed very well on this uh, second burn, getting Solar Orbiter onto that transfer trajectory. So spacecraft separation will be our next milestone, Daryl. Yeah, and if we can take a shot of the Mission Director Center here, we had a little bit of a celebration after that main engine cutoff. I believe that was probably the spacecraft team back there that was cheering. <laughs> I, I think it might have been a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Yeah, a little bit of both, because uh, Centaur performed very well looking at the uh, telemetry data here. And uh, so the launch vehicle team is very happy with uh, RL-10 and Centaur performance tonight. A lot of pride, and uh, deservedly so. Um, talk about now what what the space uh, what the Centaur is doing as so, it uh, prepares for this um, the separation event. Yeah, Centaur is maneuvering into position, uh, getting ready to uh, separate spacecraft on the uh, trajectory uh, that it needs to uh, head off into this transfer trajectory. So the RCS thrusters and everything are moving the vehicle around since body rates have slowed down, and uh, it's positioning itself in for. Uh, to uh, deliver Solar Orbiter onto uh, its uh, transfer trajectory. And you can see in that representation how it is maneuvering to get into that position just uh, a few seconds away from uh, that uh, uh, separation now. In fact, uh, just less than a minute, the uh, Centaur continues to perform well, um, and it is positioning itself at this very moment. Um, What's the, Mick, what's the actual mechanical uh, procedure that takes place in order for this spacecraft to separate from the Centaur? Well, first thing is, uh, as we said, main engine start, main engine cutoff on that second burn was very important mm -hmm. uh, to get us where we need to be. Now Centaur has positioned itself, and as you can see in the STK firing there, the graphic, the RCS continues to fire to settle out the body rates and the Centaur to get it into position and a stable mode uh, to separate this spacecraft. So rate, uh, the erection control system continues to fire at a 50% duty cycle to keep that uh, vehicle stable and where it needs to be to separate uh, uh, spacecraft SEP. We want to null all the body rates out so that we can make sure that we get good separation and no tip off. Just a few seconds away from separation, you're about to see some celebration here <laughs> at the various control rooms across the Cape and uh, across the country. The Solar Orbiter spacecraft. So we've just heard from Patrick Moore, there good go. indication of separation. That is a huge milestone for the Solar Orbiter team. Daryl, as you see in the ASOC there, they are celebrating. Yeah, and they were celebrating here in the Mission uh, Director's Center as well. You can see some hugs and handshakes uh, going around. This is, uh, of course, a, a big mission uh, for ULA, uh, especially given the collaboration that uh, took place. Uh, you're talking about 22 different countries that were involved 
in uh, this uh, spacecraft, the Solar Orbiter. We're talking about uh, a decade or more uh, in the planning. So certainly uh, United uh, Launch Alliance has a lot to be uh, happy about as they celebrate just a couple of miles from us there. Uh, the folks there standing up uh, from their console, that's Tim Dunn, in the, I believe, in the lower uh, left uh, corner there, NASA's uh, launch Tim manager, Dunn, yep. launch director, and uh, giving some good handshakes all the way around uh, for their hard work this evening, late in the evening, yeah. I should mention. Matt. Yeah, the team, the launch team is very happy. I've been looking at the data for Centaur, and the uh, quick look looks like Centaur performed very well, well within our pre-flight predictions to uh, get the solar orbiter where it needed to be, and uh, as you just heard and saw the celebration, a successful separation. Now we're just waiting to hear from our spacecraft team, you know, roughly uh, two minutes from now, hopefully, that we will get acquisition of signal and uh, make sure that everything is going well with the solar orbiter spacecraft. So the mission is a success so far, but we still have a little bit more to go to make sure Solar Orbiter is on its way. Holding out for those uh, those final moments as they pass uh, to get this spacecraft separation. We know the spacecraft team is here with us, just yes. behind us here in the Mission Director Center. Uh, they've uh, been pretty calm and collected throughout their uh, work, um, yeah. and you know them. Oh, yeah, very well. The spacecraft team, and you're going to talk to them a little bit later how things are going from that aspect, and uh, I think they're going to be very happy. You can see here the Denver Ops Center in, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the ULA engineering team is still looking at data on performance of launch vehicle. Even though we've had a successful SEP, uh, things still get looked at to make sure everything was within our pre-flight uh, predictions from that aspect. Uh, again, a very exciting moment. I, I'm very excited that we, we are here and uh, looking forward to get uh, acquisition for that. Uh, so things are going well with the teams and uh, as we proceed forward. Two, one. 